and we are broadcasting. Hi, everybody. My, oh, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to San Diego Law Library's webinar on class action primers with our wonderful speaker, Megan Wharton. Megan Ashley Wharton is here with us from uh, the city attorney's office. We're going to just let everybody have a chance to log in and get settled. So we'll take a moment or two. I see our numbers are going up. Um, just to let you know, uh, in, during this webinar, the chat feature will be turned off. So if you would like to ask any questions of Megan, please use the Q&A section. Um, we will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, but ask them as you have them, and then we can address them at the end. Um, for We'll have a little question and answer. Um, this is one of the San Diego Law Library's webinars. Uh, we are doing a lot of these MCLE webinars. It's, we're coming up on our last week before the compliance deadline for the people in group uh, group B, which is the H, what is it? H through, I forgot, H through M. So if you need any more uh, MCLE classes, we not only have webinars like this one, but we also are doing uh, webinars on our YouTube channel that you can use for self-study credits. So if you need any last minute credits, please check out the San Diego Law Library YouTube channel. And uh, we'll see if we can get a few more people in. But uh, while we're waiting, I just wanted to introduce our wonderful speaker today. Uh, Megan Wharton has been a practicing attorney for 19 years. She received her JD from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Um, after that, she went to practice uh, commercial intellectual property litigation, and she worked in law firms in San Diego, Silicon Valley, and Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and then she moved on to the, become uh, a, an attorney for the city attorneys here in San Diego. She is now the senior deputy city attorney practicing in the civil litigation division. Her practice focuses on public law disputes, including, including municipal finance issues and election law. Her practice includes litigating complex cases in a broad range of areas, including RIP proceedings, validation actions, and class actions. So she is currently defending the city in three class action cases involving Proposition 218 challenges to city actions. So we are really very lucky to have her here and taking time out of her busy schedule to teach this MCLE. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Megan. Thank you so much. Hi everybody, um, thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to give you a, a sort of an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about both federal class actions and uh, class actions under the state of California law. Um, these are both pretty broad categories. Um, in law school, I took a class on just rule 23 federal class actions. It lasted all semester. So I'm trying to cram everything into a one hour session, but I, um, I think it was made available to you an outline that has the, the general specifics of of California law and federal law and is full of case citations. So if you ever get your first class action, you need to know where to start, what to look at, that has um, all the law for you with citations. That'll get you a good start if you get served with a class action or you get hired by a plaintiff to do a class action. Um, first, I'm gonna define class action. A class action is an action where one or more plaintiffs get together and sue on behalf of a bunch of other plaintiffs only when it is shown to be necessary and superior to having separate lawsuits by each of those individual plaintiffs. Class actions are allowed as exceptions to the usual rules governing joinder and real party and interest requirements. There are different requirements and different ways of litigating class actions in federal and state court. For California class actions, there's a real simple statute that governs class actions. The statute says, when the question is one of common and general interest or general interest of many persons, and when the parties are numerous, and practical to bring them all before the court, one or more may sue or defend for the benefit of all. That is the class action statute. So that's California's version of Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23. There's not much to it. So most of the law governing California class action is case law. Um, there are some rules that govern procedures at California Rules of Court 3.760 through 3.771. That's where you go to get the nuts and bolts of how to litigate a class action, how to settle a class action, how to do a notice, how to dismiss a class action. Those rules give you the procedures, but they don't really establish the case law and the legal standards for class actions. 
The first thing about a California class action is the amount in controversy. Limited litigation cases are cases where the damage amount doesn't exceed $25,000. However, for class action purposes in California, claims are aggregated, meaning that just about any class action that's for damages is going to hit that $25,000 mark as long as everybody's claims altogether exceed $25,000. So you're going to see a class action that's subject to limited jurisdiction. The procedures for class action in California um, start with the complaint. The complaint must allege in a separate section the existence of the requirements for, for a class action. They should be listed in separate paragraphs. Um, the second step for class certification is that a motion for class certification should be made as soon as practicable after commencement of the litigation. Now, there's a lot of flexibility in what, what practicable um, it doesn't have to be done soon. I've had cases, uh, some of the cases I've litigated for the city, we haven't gotten to class certification for a couple of years. Um, so practicable is very, very flexible. Um, unless one side is pushing or the other side is pushing, the parties can work together to set up the briefing schedule for class certification. It doesn't have to be done immediately. Um, in California cases, the parties are given the opportunity to discuss to, to conduct discovery on class issues before the class certification motion is made. So if there are questions about meeting the qualifications for, for class actions, which we'll talk about in a second, the parties are allowed to conduct discovery before the class issues and neither party can force um, a class certification motion before that opportunity for discovery is given. In general, California courts do not consider the merits of a claim when they're determining whether to certify a class action. This is a pretty rigid rule. Um, it's a little bit different in federal court, but um, if you try to argue in a uh, class action motion, the court generally just ignores it. Um, the, the fourth thing, that the, the fifth thing that can happen is if you have discovery in the case and other developments, even a couple of years into the case, the defendant usually, the party opposing class certification, can actually file a motion to decertify the class based on the new facts that exist. Um, and you can, you can have a class certification motion hearing a second time, even a third time in a case, if it warrants a hearing uh, to de decertify the class. The burden of proof is always on the party seeking class certification to establish the prerequisites. And so that's usually going to be the plaintiff. And so they're usually going to have to meet that burden of proof in their motion for class certification. They have to make a prima facie showing of class of class qualification in the complaint in that separate section that we talked about a second ago. When class certification is approved or granted or denied, um, that determines whether or not it is appealable. Um, a decision by a court to deny class certification is considered a sort of death knell ruling in a class action case and an immediate appeal lies. And so if you are representing plaintiffs in a class action and class certification is denied, the first thing you wanna do is file a notice of appeal. Um, because especially in cases where there's small amounts of damages for each plaintiff, not having class certification can be the end of your case. Um, on the other hand, if you're a defendant, and an order certifying class action is, is granted, and now the plaintiffs are maintaining a class action against you, that is not an appealable order. Um, the idea is that if you're going to contest class certification, you can do that at the after final judgment. Um, you can seek writ review. Um, again, that's a writ of mandate to the Court of Appeal, and you probably have about a one to four percent likelihood of success. Um, it, it, it would it, It's reviewed for abuse of discretion, and um, Class certification, sort of class class action certifications are rarely overturned in this using this interlocutory tool. There are four prerequisites for class certification in California. You have to make a showing of all four requirements in your motion for class certification. In addition, to make things complicated, the third requirement has three sub requirements. So this is just a summary of those requirements right now. And we're going to talk about each one individually. The first is numerosity. The second is ascertainability. 
The third is a well-defined community of interest, which has three components. Class representative has typical claims. The adequacy of the, there, there is an adequacy of the class representative and the class counsel, and the case involves predominant common questions of law and fact. And the fourth, substantial benefits are achieved by using the class action me mechanism, and the class action mechanism is superior to litigation using joinder or separate actions. For numerosity, under California law, there is no minimum number of plaintiffs to satisfy this requirement. Um, courts have held that as few as 34 co-workers is sufficient to support class treatment. Generally, the threshold is about 50. Um, when you're looking at low numbers of plaintiffs, it's really good to take a look at your case and see if joinder would be a better option. Um, and have, have, the, have the, the plaintiff sue in their own name in a joint action. Um, I have cases I've defended for the city that are not class actions where there are, you know, 250 plaintiffs who are, you know, former employees, but, but they went the joinder route instead of the class action route. That's an acceptable way to do group litigation outside the class action mechanism. So if you're in the 50, the 30 to 50 range, take a really good look at whether or not joinder is a better way to go about the case. There are fewer requirements. It's easy to settle a case. It's easier to settle a case. Um, the notice requirements aren't as burdensome. And so in a lot of ways with a lower number of plaintiffs, class action is not gonna be your best option. Ascertainability. This, isn't, this, is, a, this is a concept in both federal and state class actions, and it's about the class definition. So a, a standard class definition would be something along the lines of um, everybody, worked for Mexican restaurant A and didn't receive a meal and rest break between X date and Y date. That's a class definition. And so it must be precise and objective. It can't turn on subjective um, qualification, subjective um, characteristics, meaning that it can't say everyone between X date and Y date who feels that they were subjected to mistreatment. It, it has to be a, an objective qualification to in within the, the class step. And it has to be presently ascertainable. It can't be something that requires an event to occur in the, in the future before you can ascertain whether or not a person is in the class. And this is the most important way to um, we'll get to that in a second. You must be able to define the class using objective characteristics and common transactional facts. So your, your, your class definition will have two components. It'll have a description of who is in the class and it'll have a description of what facts bring those class members together. And the fourth point, which is apply, applicable in both federal and state cases is what, what I like to call the, the self-identification test, which is, you don't have to be able to read the, have a court read the definition and the court automatically know these are the people that are in the class. What's the most important is that could your average person read the class definition and know whether or not they self-identify as a member of the class. The average person can read the class definition and self-identify in or out of the class, acceptable class definition. It doesn't have to be where the class definition automatically defines the class members for the defendant. It has to allow self-identification, which is a much less strict requirement. It is not ascertainable if it is so broad that includes people who do not have claims. And so, um, for example, a class definition that identifies all people who purchased widget, the widget, um, and it doesn't have any other transactional fact on there, and the, the allegation is the widget is defective, it would have to be and people who received a defective widget. So you can't have it be so broad that once you look at the body of the class members, half of them don't have a claim because they didn't receive a defective widget. You have to define it sufficiently that everybody that has a claim is in the class and nobody is in the class that doesn't have a claim. Um, this goes back to the point about ascertainability. 
it's sufficient if the class definition allows self-determination. Um, and at a later, it is sufficient that if at a later date, you will ask, you will be able to ascertain the class members by sort of notice or policy like that. The last issue I want to talk about on ascertainability is a new development in the law that took place in 2019. This was a big change in the law. It used to be that for a class to be ascertainable, it had to be ascertainable without unreasonable time or expense on the part of the defendant. If the defendant was going to have to spend weeks and months culling their business records or something along those lines to determine each and every member, each and every class member that purchased a widget on what date, from what store, from what production line, that would mean that a class is not ascertainable. You could actually defeat class certification by proving that it would take unreasonable time and expense to determine, to ascertain the class. There was a 2019 Supreme Court decision called Noel that got rid of that requirement. And so now, now, no matter how difficult it is for the defendant to ascertain the members of the class, if they're required to assist the plaintiff, it doesn't matter. It can still be certified as a class action. And then that burden of identifying the class members will fall on the defendant. And it could be an incredibly burdensome task to assist in the identification of the class members. The second uh, category, the second requirement is a well-defined community of interest. And this, this incorporates three elements that are, that are sometimes separately looked at in the federal. One is typicality. So the class representatives have to have claims and defenses that are typical of the class. And what that means is that the class representative can't have claims against the defendant that are not shared with the class if those claims are the predominant claims in the litigation. It also means that if the defendant has unique defenses to the class representative that it doesn't have to the rest of the class members, then typicality can be defeated there as well by showing unique defenses if you're a defendant. The adequacy of representation looks at class counsel and it, whether they can adequately represent the class. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that one in a little bit more in a minute. Predominant means that there's predominant questions of law or fact that weigh over the case. And so we're gonna talk about that one in a second, but it primarily means that the predominant issues in the case are gonna be decided in one fell swoop and that any other questions of fact or law that are independent to each individual class member will not overtake the rest of the case and require individual mini trials. For typicality, they, the plaintiffs must be injured by the same course of conduct that injured the named plaintiff. And so um, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there are circumstances where the injuries that are claimed by the representative plaintiffs are different from the injuries claimed by the named plaintiff, uh, by the plaintiffs in the class. And so you have to be careful because you can attack that if they're claiming certain injuries or certain characteristics that, that wouldn't be shared by the rest of the class. Um, importantly, the nature of the injury, so whether, um, let's say it's a, it's a class action for um, uh, what would be discrimination. And some of the plaintiffs had emotional distress injuries and some of the plaintiffs had lost wages and some of the plaintiffs had um, uh, other types of damages. Those do not have to be identical. As long as they were injured by the same course of conduct, by the same facts, so maybe by the same policy of a company, it doesn't matter that their damages and their nature of their injuries are not identical. Um, again, this goes to the unique defenses. If there are unique defenses to the named plaintiff, you can defeat class certification because by, by its very nature, the fact that the, the representative plaintiff is subject to unique defenses means that the class action is not sufficient. One very important way to deal with the class representative with unique defenses is something like a statute of limitations defense or latches or something along those lines. Um, look, for, look at your defenses and look at the name plaintiff and the characteristic plaintiff 
um, and see if you have unique defenses because that's one way to defeat class certification. The adequacy of representation looks at the class representative and the adequacy of counsel. So in the complaint or in the motion for class certification, the class representative must declare that he desires to represent the class and, and accept the fiduciary obligations. The other issue is that the class representative cannot have a conflict of interest with members of the class. And most important, this has come up in some of the cases that I have litigated with the city, the number two and number three conflicting interest among class members in the outcome of the litigation. I have a class action where people sued about water rates and the water rates charged of, of some water rate customers, but they included all the water customers in there. And the way it works, because water rates are a zero sum game, if the, if the plaintiffs win their case, their, some of the water rates for some of the plaintiffs are gonna go down, but the net result of that is, is that the water rates for some of the other plaintiffs are going to go up. And so that's the kind of conflict that you would be looking for um, in a class. Um, it is difficult to prevail. I, would, I did not prevail by arguing that, making that argument against class certification. And so it's very difficult to prevail there, but it is possible. Um, another issue is the plaintiff may not be an adequate class representative or if he or she has credibility. Um, this is important employment type cases. Um, I worked on a class action, an, an employment class action when I was in private practice, and we found out that the named plaintiff had falsified a number of his time cards. And so um, we put a tremendous pressure on class certification and eventually they had to sub out and it took out some of the, it, it took out the date range of some of their claims. And so if you can develop credibility issues with the, plain, the named plaintiff, you can cause problems for the class action. On the class counsel issue, they look at the qualifications of counsel. And pretty much in California, you can attack class counsel if the counsel has no prior class action experience and does not associate with someone with experience. And so it's not that you're prohibited from litigating a class action if you have no class action experience, but if it is your first class action, you need to associate with someone with experience, bring them in on your case, or you could be attacked for adequacy of representation. Um, and again, similar to the class representative, class counsel must agree to protect the interests of the class as a whole, rather than the interests of the class represent representatives. So by making this agreement, what you're agreeing to say is I'm not gonna go around the class and try to get a sweetheart settlement for these class representatives and hang the class, the class members out to draw. So you have to agree to make that, you have to agree that you're gonna uphold that standard. And if you don't uphold that standard as an attorney, you could be in big trouble if, if those types of deals or those types of arrangements um, above board. The next, the next issue is predominance. And what they're looking at here is they're trying to avoid what, what's called in the class action context, mini trials. So each member must be, not be required to individually, individually litigate numerous and substantial questions to determine their right to recover. And so what this is saying, and, and where you'll see this the most, um, what, the best example of this is employment classification where a group of employees are saying that they were misclassified as managers when they should have been hourly employees and received overtime. And so some, many of these cases do not get certified as a class action because you actually have to look at each individual plaintiff, look at their job duties and determine, in order to determine whether or not there is liability. And so in those cases, unless the plaintiffs can show that they have really identical working situations, they're not gonna have the right to have a class action on that because each, in order for each individual plaintiff to prove their case, they have to prove up their individual circumstances. And so that's when you don't have predominance. Now, when every individual plaintiff has the same liability question, and then after liability is answered, you would require many trials to litigate damages, that is allowed, you still have predominance. So 
if predominance goes to whether or not there's liability, if, if, it, if, if the question is whether or not there is liability will require many trials, then you don't have predominance. If the question is whether damages will require many trials, then you can have predominance. The other issue is that the, the, the questions of law and fact that are gonna be tried jointly must be substantial. So they must be the key issues in the case. It can't just be one tangential issue um, that joins the class and then have to have many trials on, with all the other litigants. Um, if that's the case, then you're not gonna have, have meet the advantageous requirement. This is what I, the point I was making. If the liability can be determined by facts common to all members of the class, it will be certified, even if they need to prove damages. The opposite is also true. The final requirement is substantial benefits and superiority. A trial court will permit a class action only when you can demonstrate that a class action will give substantial benefits to the litigants and the courts that you can't achieve through joinder. Um, this, this factor overlaps with a number of the other questions, such as numerosity and predominance. A class action is not going to be superior when there are questions affecting each clan, cl class member's right to recover. So again, liability. Each member liability analysis, then it's not going to, you're not going to have superiority. And if there aren't a substantial number of claimants, you're not going to have superiority over a joinder action. And so superiority sort of combines some of the other, other aspects of the analysis into a bigger analysis of overall, is this going to work? Is this going to be superior to an, an action with joinder or individual actions? Are we going to save time for the court and the parties? Or are we just going to make this a big morass of many trials and motion practice and extensive discovery of all class members to where it's not a superior mechanism for litigating the case. Um, these are the factors that are considered under California law. This is case law, it's in the outline, but um, the interest of each member in controlling his or her own case personally. Um, this will become a factor when the claims are very large. So when each class member has a has an individual claim that exceeds a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, then the theory is is that it's really better because there's such a substantial stake to have individual actions so that each class member or proposed class member can control their own action. The difficulties in managing the case that goes to the mini trial question. If there's going to be a number of mini trials, then then it's not a superior mechanism. Um, any litigation that's already pending. So if you have 10 or 15 actions out there by individual plaintiffs that would be members of the class, the court's gonna be hesitant to certify a class action. Um, and then the, the fourth issue is, is the desirability of combining all the claims in a single court. This is usually products liability type cases where you have cases brought throughout the state complain, complaining of defective products. Um, and you want to bring them all into a single court, that, that can be done sometimes using the class action mechanism. Class notice. Um, again, we could do a whole webinar on the rules for class notice in California. The rules are very specific and they're detailed in California Rule of Court 3.766. Um, the court will rule on what notice is required after certification. So after you have class certification, it's the responsibility of the plaintiff to propose a form of notice. You can either propose the form of notice directly to the court, or you can hammer out the form of notice with defendants before proposing it to the court for approval. Um, if there's no monetary relief sought in the complaint, um, if it's an injunction or something along those lines, um, maybe an, an injunction to abate a nuisance or so, something like that, then you don't have to have notice. Um, but the court can order notice. It's just not mandatory. Um, costs of notice in class actions can be substantial. Um, I have a class that I'm defending um, that has about 280,000 class members. And the cost of class notice is, is in the $50,000 range. Um, under appropriate circumstances, a defendant can be required to share the cost of notice, but generally the cost of notice is borne by the plaintiff. 
The only time a California court will come in and say that the defendant has to bear the cost is when the defendant makes notice difficult by withholding information or something along those lines. And so unless you have misconduct by the defendant, the plaintiff is going to bear the cost of notice in California. Dismissal. Always, always, always. The court must approve, approve the dismissal of any class action, whether or not it has been certified. Um, this is, again, to protect the interests of the class members who are not participating in the litigation. Um, a lot of times when a class has not been certified, dismissal will not be an issue. Um, if a class has been certified, it may require some sort of notice or something along those lines, especially if the class has already been given notice before the court will allow the case to be dismissed. Um, a settlement of class actions in California. This is, you could take a whole class on this all day long. Um, there are very specific procedures about how to settle a class action in California. Um, they're detailed in the California rules of court. Um, things to keep in mind, because this is just a high question, the things you should keep in mind is that settlement of a class action requires court approval at two separate hearings. Um, first, you have an approval for preliminary approval. You have a hearing for preliminary approval of the settlement in the form of notice. So you go into the court and you propose a form of notice that notifies all the class members that the class action is going to be settled. And then it gives them an opportunity and instructions on how to opt out of any settlement if they want to. And then several weeks or a month or two later, the court will hold what's called the fairness hearing. And in that hearing, any class members who object to the settlement can come in and object. And at the end of that hearing, the court will decide whether or not to allow the settlement or he can decide that the settlement's really not in the best interest of the class members and send everybody back to the bargaining table. Okay, so that wraps up state class actions. I'm now going to move on and talk about federal class actions. Um, federal class actions are governed by Rule 23 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. This is a very comprehensive, detailed rule. If you're involved in a federal class action, read the rule every day and make sure that what you're doing is in compliance with the rule. Um, federal courts follow the rule to the T. And so it's really important that you're familiar with the rule every time you go into a hearing, um, every time you do a filing of a motion or anything like that, you need to make sure that what you're doing meets with the requirements of rule 23. For timing of class certification, um, the rule says it must be as early as practicable after the complaint has been filed. Um, if it involves a request for money damages, certification must take place before any determination on the merits. That's what the law says, but I just did a class action in federal court against the city of San Diego where we actually did a motion for summary judgment before taking up any of the class certification issues because that's what the parties agreed to do, because there was a threshold legal issue that was would make or break the case, and we decided to deal with that first. Um, the courts will let you do that if you ask, um, especially when it involves a question of public policy. Um, and so we were able to prevail on summary judgment with ever, without ever having to go through the process of notice and class certification. Um, on injunctions, a district court can issue a preliminary injunction prior to class certification. Um, it's a little bit murky in state court whether or not that's possible, and it usually doesn't happen. Questions of proof. The plaintiff must prove the factual elements of class status by a preponderance of the evidence. And in federal court, the court may consider merit questions if they are relevant to determining whether or not Rule 23 requirements have been satisfied. And so unlike in state court where there's hard and fast rule against considering the merits, in federal court, you can ask the court to consider questions of the merits when he's evaluating, if it is in the context of evaluating the federal rule 23 prerequisites for class certification. Review of class certification decisions. An order by a district court granting or denying class certification is not appealable on interlocutory review. However, the Court of Appeal has discretion to allow immediate appeal 
from, from granting or denying class certification. You have to, I think it's in the, in the outline, but I think you have, if you have an order granting or denying class certification, you have to seek review from the circuit court, I think within 14 days. And it is, it is viewed, it is reviewed on a, an abuse of discretion um, sta uh, standard. Therefore, the likelihood of overturning a grant or denial of class certification on interlocutory review to the circuit court is relatively low because the abuse of discretion standard is so deferential to the trial courts. For all federal cases, there's four requirements. Um, these are commonly referred to by one word each, numerosity, commonality, typicality, and adequacy. Numerosity is that it's so, nor the standard is, is it so numerous that joinder would be impracticable. Commonality, is are there questions of law or fact common to the class? Typicality, the claims or defenses of the class representatives must be typical of the class. Adequacy, class representatives and the class council able to fairly and adequately represent the interests of the class. These are the four issues that you have to brief as a threshold matter in your request for class certification. So rule 23 is basically a two-step analysis. First, you have, to, you have to meet 23A. You have to show all four requirements. After that, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, you have, to brief, you have to brief which category under 23B and C. And so it's a two-part two test. Do you meet the four requirements and do you fall under a category for an appropriate class action? Numerosity. Again, the class must be so numerous that joiners is impracticable. Practicable does not mean impossible. And so some people would argue, well, it's impossible to join, it, it, it's impracticable to join 500 people, but it's not impossible. So class action is not acceptable. That's not true. It just has to be, you know, what is practical for the parties? It, it, you don't have to prove impossibility. Under federal law in the Ninth Circuit, generally 40 to 50 people can, discriminate, can demonstrate efficiency and economy. Um, but courts generally hold that less than 40 do not qualify for class treatment because they find that joinder would be more appropriate. Um, under federal law, numerosity incorporates ability. And so again, the principle here is self-identification. Is the class described in such a manner that a person hearing the class description could self-identify as a member of the class? If the class definition meets that requirement, it meets ascertainability, which is an element of numerosity. Commonality. For commonality in federal law, there must be a common question of fact or law in the case that is capable of class-wide resolution in one stroke. That's a common phrase used by the courts. You have to have one question of fact or law that you can decide basically on one brief and one decision that affects every one of the classroom members all exactly the same. You can't allege a violation of the same law. That's not sufficient. To say um, that you allege a violation of, of 1983 um, federal civil rights law is not sufficient because that violation could be quite a different types of conduct. And so it has to be something more than that. It has to be a common pattern of conduct and whether or not that common pattern of conduct that affected all the class members is legal or not legal, which can be decided in one stroke. The second, the next part of this is they must be sufficiently important to the resolution of the case. Again, you can't come up with a common fact or a common question of law that is really a tangent in the case and doesn't really get to the meat of the claims of each of the class members. Um, suits that seek joint relief, such as injunction or declaratory judgment, usually meet commonality by their very nature. Now, this is primarily suits against the government. Um, when you're asking for declaratory injunctive relief to stop or compel a government action, um, 
that affects a broad number of people or people with certain characteristics, they meet commonality on their own and you don't have to go much further than proving that. Typicality, um, the, the class representatives must possess the same interest and suffer the same injury as the unnamed class members. Um, the common claims must be central. A claim is typical if it arises under the same event or practice. And so, um, for example, a similar event would be a plane crash, um, a fire at a nightclub. Um, a similar practice would be um, a practice of not promoting women to partner at a law firm. Um, and in those common events or common practices, you can decide liability as to the common event or common practice in, in one fell swoop. And so those types of claims are sufficient for class actions. Again, you cannot defeat the typicality by saying that once you decide liability, it's going to be it's going to require separate decisions to determine damages. Again, if if everything is common except for remedies, class action can still be appropriate. For adequacy, the cl the class representative and the class counsel have to agree to prosecute the action vigorously. You have to have competent and experienced counsel. One of the things that's important again here is that you cannot have a class representative's claim that is inconsistent or in conflict with some of the other class members' claims. So the best way to look at that is if the named, if the named plaintiff wins, they're gonna get X. And is that gonna be detrimental to any of the class, class members? And if that, if that type of conflict exists, and it's irreconcilable, then there is a conflict and the class representative is not adequate. And again, same as California, if the class representative is subject to unique defenses, it will defeat adequacy. So again, if you're a defendant or you're representing a defendant in one of these cases, if you can find problems with the class, class representative, either unique defenses or credibility issues, you have a better chance of defeating uh, class certification. The next step in a federal class action is to qualify for a category. And so rule 23B establishes essentially three or how you look at it, four categories of actions. And so when you move for class certification and even in your complaint, you need to tell the court what kind of action you are bringing. So not only do you have to prove numerosity, typicality, um, adequacy and commonality, you also have to prove that you fall under one of these categories of 23B. Um, the first is 23B1A, which is incompatible standards of conduct. And this is um, often government actions um, or uh, it, it, it comes under homeowners actions also. There's a risk of prejudice from separate actions establishing standards of conduct. So if you think about a feedlot next to a residential subdivision, and if the, if the owners of the homes in the residential subdivision each brought a nuisance action against the feedlot owner, you could end up with different judgments on whether or not the feedlot is a nuisance. And so in that case, you need to have a single class action so that the court can establish the standard of conduct for the feedlot owner in one action. And, and, and so that's the type of suit that we're talking about here. Um, Judgments affecting all class members. This is B1B generally is referred to as the common fund case. Um, and this is where you have insurance proceeds, trust assets, um, corporate assets and liquidation, um, anything like that where there's a pot of money and the claims of everyone that has a claim to that pot of money um, exceed the value of the pot of money. And so anytime you have that, um, you have to, you you need to have a class action because if you have individual actions, individual plaintiff, a cut of the pot, and there may not be enough left for the other members of the class. So that's called the common fund class. B two is injunction classes. These are almost always government claims. These are claims of harassment. Um, uh, the common, the most common one that the city faces and we're facing today is 
an injunction class action brought by homeless people uh, downtown who alleged mistreatment by the police. And they're seeking an injunction um, and a command from the court that the, the police and the city have to engage in the homeless using under certain standards of conduct. And so that's called an injunctive class. And it, it's almost always involves civil rights or constitutional claims where you're seeking injunctive or declaratory relief against a government body. Um, so you want the government body to change its conduct towards a class of people. The third type of class action uh, under, under 23B is, is where common questions predominate. And this is where you have your damages actions. So all of the ones, the categories that we just talked about before, those are primarily, with the exception of the common fund, involve cases where the court is issuing an injunction or declaratory relief. Those cases are not predominantly about damages. In this third category, all of your class actions that are based in requests for damages, products liability, employment discrimination, wage and hour cases, um, product defect, um, those types of cases. Um, and, and the definition of this is pretty broad. The questions of law and fact common to the class predominate over questions affecting of individual members and the class action is superior to other methods of adjudicating the controversy. So this follows, it, it, once it shakes out, it's very similar to the requirements for California. Um, there's four factors that go to determining superiority. Individually controlling the case, any existing litigation, having the litigation in a forum, and difficulties in managing um, individual litigation versus um, class litigation. In federal cases, uh, there are also really um, procedures governing how class notice is done. Um, as part of the class certification or generally the court mandates the form, content, and manner of the notice. It's part of the order for class certification. It is generally not based on a proposal from one or both of the parties. Um, in the injunction class actions that we talked about, um, the first three categories, notice is discretionary. However, the court can order notice, especially in a common fund type case. In damages class actions, notice is mandatory. And so the plaintiffs are required to give notice to all class members the best way they can um, of the class and also give them an opportunity to opt out and litigate their claims against the defendant on their own. In federal court, the plaintiff always pays for class notice. There's no provision in federal law allowing the court to shift the burden of the cost of notice. It's something that the plaintiff bears as part of bringing the class action. Again, in federal court, a certified class action cannot be dismissed or compromised without court approval. And settlement, there's generally one settlement hearing. And at that hearing, the parties brief and then the court decides whether or not it is fair, reasonable and adequate for all of the class members. So again, in the settlement process, you have the court coming in on top of what's been negotiated but between the named plaintiffs and the defendants to make sure that the payout, the award to each of the individual class members is fair, reasonable and adequate. And so it's not uncommon for a defendant and a plaintiff to negotiate a settlement, um, especially that has a very large attorney's fees award for plaintiff's attorneys, but has very little um, compensation for the individual class members for the court to reject that kind of settlement. Um, and so you have to be careful when you're negotiating a settlement of a class action that you're actually giving the named, the, the class members something tangible and beneficial as part of the settlement. So that's all I have. Um, I can take questions now. Oh, all right. If anybody has questions for Megan, please use the Q&A feature again to ask any questions. Uh, so let's see if we've got any questions yet. We're just waiting for people to ask some questions. Sure. 
So I feel like we all learned about this. This was, I was um, just transported back to my civil procedure class, my <laughs> first year in law school with many of these questions and many of these issues. I think that that is, we used a specific example of a mine disaster in West Virginia to learn about all of the rules of civil procedure and focused actually heavily on uh, 23B, yep. interestingly enough. But does anybody have any questions about class action lawsuits? Um, I have, if, if you don't have any questions or you're getting them in, I do have a list of the key differences between federal and California class actions that, that I can just go over really quickly and while people are getting their questions in. The most important difference is that under California law, there is a public policy favoring class action. And there's no similar public policy favoring class action under federal law. And so what that means is that under California law, when the court could go one way or the other, he's likely to certify class action because of the public policy in favor of it. And you don't have that going for you as a plaintiff in federal court. Um, another key difference is that California courts don't allow dispositive motions before certification. Um, federal courts allow those types of motions. And so um, it, 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 it can be done. You have to weigh the costs and benefits because um, especially for the defendant, you, if, you, if, you're, if you definitely need class-wide wide relief, it can, a, a dispositive motion that's in your favor that only involves the named plaintiffs may be subject to attack later um, as not providing class-wide relief. Um, another big difference is that um, in depositions and discovery, in California, you can pretty much take unlimited depositions of unnamed class members. And so um, in federal court, you have to get a court order to take the deposition of a unnamed class member and it imposes a heavy burden. And so it's very difficult to take depositions of unnamed class members. It's very easy in a California action. Um, the tolling rules are different for California and federal law. Um, federal law has a hard and fast rule about tolling. Um, the statute of limitations is told until class certification is denied or if class certification is granted, it's told to the end of the case. California law does sort of a balancing test on tolling. And so um, whether or not your claims are told during the pendency of the class action is determined sort of on a case by case basis if you try to bring a second action and the statute of limitations is raised. And then the other big issue between California and federal state, uh, federal cases is that who pays for class notice. Under California law, if you're a plaintiff and you have good reason, you can shift the burden of paying for class notice in part or in total to the defendant. Under federal law, that type of burden shifting is not allowed. So those are the main differences between the two. Um, oh, and then um, one more difference is the interlocutory appeal. You have an automatic right to appeal a class certification denial in California. In federal court, there's no automatic right to appeal. It is, it is a request for review to the Ninth Circuit, which is discretionary. Okay, that's it. I we think do you're have some mute. questions from Michelle, okay. um, who asks, please explain the differences, if any, in enforcing class action waivers in contracts, like at your dental office or an employment agreement. I actually am not read up on that topic. Um, it, is, it is a very hot topic right now. There's a lot of case law in federal and state law and I have not read up on that. So I wouldn't be comfortable answering that question. Okay. It, it's not an area that, that I, it's not something that is involved in the cases that I work on for the city. And so it's not an area I'm very familiar with. All right, well, and that was, Michelle was just gonna then ask about the difference between federal and state courts. So we'll save that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions for Megan today? No. Okay, well, I think that that is, Oh, here we go. Yep. Oh, Michelle says, thank you. It was very informative. So we, okay. yes, we, I definitely feel we thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us, Megan. We appreciate it. If you would like to uh, watch this video again or refer it to somebody else, we will have it published um, later today on the San Diego Law Library website for self-study credit. And um, we thank you very much, Michelle, or Megan, excuse me, for being here. 
and taking your time to provide us with this really interesting topic of law. And I thank you to all of our attendees for being here. We appreciate your presence. And um, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Megan, to, to if you'd like any last words. Okay, I just, um, just the, the most important thing I can tell you is if you're doing one of these in federal court is read the rule every day. Um, it, it's the most important thing when you're dealing with a class action. Um, and there's a lot more flexibility in state court because everything's by common law, but in federal court, it's very rigid. And if you don't comply with the rules, you could be in trouble. Right. So those are my final thoughts. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Megan. And um, when we uh, end this webinar, you will be uh, diverted directly to a survey. So we do ask that you take the survey to give um, Megan feedback and also us feedback on how we're doing. Uh, we really appreciate it. And with that, thank you guys very much for your attendance here today. Thank you um, for, to Megan for being here with us and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.